All right, uh, why don't we uh, get started? So we do have a homework due uh, this evening at the usual uh, one second uh, before uh, midnight. And uh, please make sure uh, that you answer all parts of the assignment uh, when it says to demonstrate empirically. Uh, if some demonstration uh, includes a limit as some quantity goes to infinity, uh, it's up to you to uh, successively increase the size of that quantity and then describe what happens as a result of that. Your description uh, can certainly and should include uh, some plots uh, along with uh, the uh, prose that you uh, or writing that you include um, to, for your description. Okay. Any questions about this? No? All right. Uh, so when we left off, uh, we talked about this idea of motion, and we talked about uh, issues uh, in computer vision. Uh, one of the things we talked about is when things move. And we depicted, in this frame at least, uh, with my wonderful artwork, um, uh, a picture of something at some time t0, and a picture of that same object at some short amount of time t1 uh, later. Now, it doesn't matter what the difference is between t0 and t1. It can be milliseconds. It can be a second. Uh, that's not the point uh, of this uh, uh, discussion. And so you have things move, and we superimpose them uh, over one another, and you can see that uh, the positions of the stick figure uh, in this fictitious uh, picture uh, is a little bit different. And so from the perspective of a camera, if you're trying to computationally uh, track some moving object, uh, the camera doesn't know necessarily that the red version of the figure is uh, the same thing as the original black version uh, of the figure, right? It has to find it. Now, fortunately, the laws of physics are on your side, and this is a so-called inertial system, uh, meaning that the future state of this object, its position, uh, has something to do with the current state, uh, plus or minus some delta. And so if you are going to track this object in the camera, um, you need to identify uh, if the red version, the figure at time t1, is also the same thing or object uh, in the original uh, version that as the original uh, position or the object at the original position at time t0, right? And so essentially, uh, to find the red figure, you're trying to say, um, show me those pixels uh, that uh, correspond to, as it were, uh, the black version of the figure at time uh, t0. Okay, and this is a so-called correspondence problem. It's a really, really important uh, issue in computer vision uh, because you can do lots and lots of pretty cool things with it. And I'll show you today uh, some of those cool things. Okay, so correspondence problem. It makes the naive assumption uh, that you have two cameras. Now you can also solve the correspondence problem with one camera uh, that are, that's in two different positions. So that means the camera is moving. And so uh, this camera, in uh, this two camera assumption is the same as having one camera uh, that moves. And so most of the scene points are visible in both images, meaning that you can see everything for the most part in both images and that the corresponding image patches, the object of interest, uh, is similar, right? Uh, because, because if it's like dramatically different, changes completely, uh, then you know, there's no real information you can use uh, to do comparisons or to draw comparisons. And one of the examples of that could be, let's say if you're tracking an object, and that person, you know, certainly when they're facing the camera, looks very different from when they're turned sideways uh, to the camera. Right, because there are pixels that are not being imaged when you're facing the camera. And so if the person within that time between T0 and T1 turns, right, uh, so that their side profile view uh, to the camera, uh, it's going to be really hard to find those pixels in the new time instant. Okay, uh, so they have to be similar in some way. And of course, uh, the distance uh, from the object uh, to the camera uh, has to be bigger than the distance between the cameras. If you're dealing with two cameras, uh, that's the case. If you're dealing with one camera, then the amount of distance the camera moved uh, has to be much, much less uh, than the distance to the camera of the object that you're trying to uh, image. And so how you do it is you have one image at time t0, and then given the other image at time t1, you literally search within that new image uh, for the existence of some patch uh, of interest. Okay? All right. Now, of course, this can lead to a very large so-called search space because you know as you go up in resolution, 
right, to high definition or maybe 4K imagery or 6K imagery, um, you're going to have very many pixels. And if you have very many pixels and you're searching for objects or patches or subregions within an image, um, then you're going to have very many of them because that screen real estate or the size of the image is quite large. And so in order to speed this up, you have to introduce certain constraints. And these constraints include things like inertia, right? If delta t between time t0 and t1 is very, very small, let's say one millisecond, you know that the object couldn't have moved more than a certain distance. So instead of searching all regions of the image, you search in the vicinity of the last place you saw that object. OK? All right. Any questions about this? Uh, so then we mentioned correlation as one uh, measure, one statistic you can use uh, to find um, patches within images. And so it's the same correlation we talked about. And if you think about an image, you have a bunch of values. Those are the pixel values. And you're taking x, which is the set of pixels uh, for the image, say, at time t0, and y, uh, a patch uh, in the image uh, from time uh, t1. And you're just uh, changing what those patches are, and you evaluate in correlation. Now, this will give you a number. And that's a linear dependence between the values associated with random variable x and y. Uh, but this is going to peak at some point. It's going to achieve a maximum value. And that location in the new image where you achieve that maximum value is, of course, what you're going to call your correspondence, um, that part of the old image that most closely corresponds or matches uh, to that particular part of the new image. OK, any questions about this? Does that make sense? So you might be wondering, why in the world would anyone care about this? Uh, so I'll show you a couple interesting applications where people use correspondence to do all sorts of interesting things. OK, so let's continue on. And um, let's show you an example using something like correlation, a type of matching score. And here at time t0, we have uh, an image of, uh, I don't remember what that is, uh, but there's a scene. And you can see a bunch of towers here and some uh, doorways, right? And so in this particular image at time t0, the camera has moved uh, to the right. Now, if the camera pans or moves to the right, everything that you're viewing in the image is going to go whooshing to the left, right? So all of the pixels that were in a particular location of the first image are going to be a little bit more to the left in that version of the image at time t1. So if we look at that doorway here that's sort of been cropped out or circled or, or, or identified here uh, with that red box, right, that identifies a patch or region of that original uh, picture at time t0. And so you can in MATLAB, or you can do it yourself in code, uh, you can crop out a region of an image or a patch. All right? Now, of course, one of the things you might want to know is when you move the camera, where did these pixels go in the new image? Now, to show you or prove to you that the pixels in the image did in fact shift, if you look at that tower, right, that turret, on the left-hand side of the original image at T0, and the gap between the left edge of the image and the left edge of that turret, you'll notice that gap is a lot smaller at time T1, right? Um, so absolutely, uh, all of the pixels depicted in the image at time T0, they shifted uh, to the left. In addition, well, some of the pixels disappeared because that first half, like here, disappeared while new pixels entered on the right-hand side. So if you were going to track automatically with a camera and running some software, if you wanted to track that red cropped region of the image at T0, you need to find where it is in the new image at T1. Now, of course, uh, in the second image, there are certain things that you might think are the image or that uh, cropped region uh, in red in the original image. Um, and I've circled a couple of them. Well, one of them is the ground truth, the actual cropped region from the original, right? You can see that. And then you might have a bunch of other patches or regions uh, that you explore, right? Because you're searching literally uh, from the camera for uh, that location or that patch in the image at T1 to try to find where it went from T0 to T1. So then you take an image, you move the camera, you take another image, and you might want to ask, where did the doorway go, this uh, pink or red uh, cropped region, from time T0 to T1, right? So 
that ascertain, uh, 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 ascertaining as to where it went, that's the so-called correspondence problem. Uh, the pixels in T0 uh, in that pink region, um, what does it correspond to uh, in the image uh, version of T1? Okay, so you might say, gosh, well, these green crop regions, those are candidates, those are regions in the new image where uh, that um, original location might have moved when the camera moved. So what do you do? Okay, so you want to compute a function. You're going to compare uh, that red crop region from the image at T0 uh, to all of these different candidate locations um, uh, for patches uh, in the image at time T1. So, of course, you might run something like correlation uh, between uh, this red crop region and the first green region, the red crop region and the second green region, the red crop region and the third one, and the fourth one. And visually, just looking only at the cropped region candidates, you'll notice here that the second cropped green region uh, in the, from the image at time T1 most closely matches, at least visually, uh, that original red cropped region or pink cropped region. Now, if you were going to me uh, measure correlation, if you think about what correlation does, right, it involves distributions. And in this case, we're looking at distributions of these gray level, intense, uh, these gray level values, okay? I don't want to use a word yet until I actually define it. So um, these gray level values. You could literally plot a histogram of all these gray values uh, for the images, and essentially you're comparing these uh, histograms, right, uh, in some way. And so correlation will absolutely do that. And if you were to perform this calculation, uh, which you will uh, in, a, in a project, um, you're going to find that the second green crop region, that patch candidate from the image at time T1, uh, that's going to have the highest correlation among all the tested regions. So you might ask, well, how do I actually do this? Well, I've noted a couple green crop regions, but you can imagine a single green box in some starting location scanning around in that image, the version at time T1, uh, looking for that cropped region associated uh, with the highest value return from correlation. And as you can imagine, that's going to take a lot of time if you have a lot of different positions where you can put that green crop region uh, in the uh, T1 version of the image. Okay. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? And so in order to track uh, images or objects in an image, uh, you're going to have to solve the correspondence problem. Okay. So it's really, really important. Okay. So you might ask, well, okay, that's all fine and good, but why is it a thing? Well, one of the things you can do with correspondence, and this is depicted here. In this image, we have two cameras. Uh, we have camera one, C1, and that's the uh, center of focus, the focal point of the first camera, the optical center. And we have the center of camera two marked as C2. Now, of course, the image plane is depicted as these sheets here, uh, and these sheets uh, will return back pixels associated with the ball position uh, in the environment. And so here in the perspective or from the perspective of camera C1, uh, we have a position of the ball at, uh, at a point on this plane called X1. And then likewise, camera C2 also sees the ball, uh, a point on its image plane uh, X2. But you will notice that depending on the position of the camera, that ball location is going to look different. Right? If I were to set up a camera on the left side of the room and the right side of the room and the camera can see you, the left-hand camera and the right-hand camera are going to place you in a different position on the image plane just because of pure geometry. Right? The rays of the light collected through the aperture goes through the lens and hits uh, the image plane and is returned back as a, an array of values are pixels. So the interesting part about correspondence now, once you find, let's say from the perspective of C1, you see some object of interest. You crop that out. Now, your computation searches in the image returned from camera C2. And it says, OK, well, where in this image from camera C2 do I see these pixels that I've cropped out of the image uh, from camera C1? Now, once you find that, now you know the relative position of that object within the image uh, plane uh, of camera C1 and camera C2. Now, if you know, which you usually do, the distance between camera C1 and C2, the straight line distance, now you've formed a triangle. And then using pure trigonometry, you can actually find the distance uh, of that ball from the perspective of the line that connects C1 and C2 using pure trigonometry. So what does that give you? That gives you the third dimension depth, 
right? So if you think about what happens on the image plane, well, from the perspective of camera C1 and C2, it says, okay, um, the position of the ball X1 is so many tick marks along the X axis and so many along uh, the Y axis. And then C2 does the same thing. It's a different set of tick marks from along X and along Y. Now, given that X and Y, some, for many applications, it's really important to know how far something is away from you. Now, if you can figure out the depth, which you certainly can using trigonometry, just by solving the correspondence problem between two cameras and knowing the distance between those two cameras, you can reconstruct the depth or what's called a depth map. And it's correspondence uh, that enables that. So you might be wondering, well, you can, the procedure is called triangulation. You're basically completing uh, the height of the triangle uh, by knowing uh, the angle that this object makes for the two hypotenuses, right? Uh, and then you know the base of this triangle, uh, which is the distance between the cameras. You can use trigonometry um, and using facts about um, sine, cosine, tangent, and three, four, five uh, triangles uh, in order to figure out what the height of these uh, triangles are, which is the depth of the ball, uh, the distance of the ball. Okay? All right. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? So correspondence is what allows you to figure out where x2 is given uh, x1. And you literally have to search within that second image for that patch uh, from the first image. OK. And so there's an interesting uh, application. Uh, it's called photo stitching, right? And so in this particular picture, uh, you can either have more than one camera or you can have a moving camera. Uh, but in deployed applications, the popular thing is to have more than one camera. But it's the same problem, right? Whether it's a single moving camera or uh, multiple cameras. So you have a bunch of cameras, positions here, all right? Uh, and those camera positions are known, so you know the distances uh, between uh, the cameras at each position. Now, each camera returns an image. And let's just assume, for the sake of uh, discussion, that each one of these cameras is so-called synchronized, meaning that if they give you 30 pictures a second or 30 frames a second, all of these images come at precisely the same time. You can absolutely trigger these cameras uh, to do that. Okay, so now that means if you have some object in the environment um, and you can find the correspondence within the first image, the second image, the third image, the fourth image, now you can use triangulation to compute a very, very high fidelity depth map and reconstruct in three dimensions what you're measuring from each camera in two dimensions. Okay. Does that make sense? Any questions about this? Okay. So why should you care? And this is an actual application uh, that's used in sporting events uh, for something called 3D uh, instant replay. And it's purely using this photo stitching idea uh, and finding correspondences. So let me play that. And so the ability to do this 360 fly through and see 3D objects is because of correspondence and this photo stitching. And that's the 3D reconstructed object. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, and so I won't play. I won't play the whole thing of this next one. This is sort of the finished product used uh, during an actual broadcast. Okay, and let me stop there. I know I'm gonna get a copyright dispute for that on YouTube, but I'll just deal with that later. All right, so that's um, one uh, example. Another very powerful um, use of correspondence problem, just to show you how major it is in computer vision, uh, is optic flow. Now, have you ever driven in a snowstorm? I know people here don't know snow, like in Massachusetts, but you ever drive in a snowstorm and you see as the snowflakes fall, right? They come whooshing towards you and they kind of seem to kind of spread out a little bit as they come towards you. Uh, that's exactly what optic flow is. And so as you're driving, Right, objects that are closer to you um, move faster than objects uh, from the perspective of the image than objects that are further away. Right, uh, because you're far away, the distance that you cover, you don't see very much displacement or movement in pixels associated with those objects versus things that are close to you. So what you do is you take an image and you take a snapshot, and then some short time later you take another snapshot, and then for every a regular set of patches in your image. You might chop your images up into a certain number of rows and columns, kind of like a Sicilian pizza, you slice it up. And then for each patch, you run this correspondence to see where that set of pixels moved from the first time instant to the second time instant. So then when you know where it moved, you draw a vector whose uh, magnitude or, or, or length represents uh, the size of the displacement or magnitude of the displacement, and the orientation of that vector represents um, the direction in which those pixels moved for that patch, right? And this is a so-called optic flow field. And optic flow fields are used in computer vision for all sorts of things, and it's based on correspondence, um, the information you use in order to compute or calculate this flow field. And so how might you use optic flow? Let's say you're in a robot vehicle, autonomous car, and it's driving. You see the flow field corresponding to things that are whooshing by, obstacles, things you might bump into are closer to you, right? And so how might you characterize an obstacle? Well, if you see something that's right in front of you, you might crash into, you're going to see a region in your flow field where the vectors tend to be larger in magnitude, right? It's getting too close to you. There's something called structure from motion. Right. Uh, given a moving camera, uh, how do you reconstruct the three dimensional shape of something? You use optic flow fields and some other statistics over it. But nonetheless, you can reconstruct the geometry of an object by just looking at how the flow field changes over time as you move the camera around an object. OK, any questions about this? All right. Well, in the next slide, I'll actually show you an example of an optic flow field. It's a very simple one uh, that someone has implemented, uh, but nonetheless, it drives home the point. There are some spurious artifacts, but you can see how these arrows correspond to the motion of the hand, the edges, the book, and so forth. All right, uh, so let me play that again. And there are some spurious artifacts uh, because of you know just the, the time horizon used and the sample rate of the camera, but it illustrates the point still. Someone's moving, they take a sequence of images, compute the flow field, display them as they move that object. Okay? You can actually reconstruct with enough of these, uh, reconstruct the shape of the book. Okay? All right. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? Okay, so that's optic flow. Um, and we will finish this module uh, with that. All right. So any questions about this? So let me switch to the next module, and we'll pick back up uh, with a little bit more about um, how we depict images so that you can calculate things computationally uh, like optic flow. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> so um, when we looked at this picture, I asked the question, which one of these things is not like the other. And you all had kind of these different 
uh, intuitive feel for ways in which things can be different. They can be different in terms of their size, absolutely, in terms of their color, or maybe you know the low level shape uh, of uh, these individual fish might be different here and there. Absolutely, we talked about correspondence and we looked at differences and tried to track, bless you, where uh, the stick figure move uh, in the image at time t0, the black version of the stick figure, uh, from the red version at time t1 uh, of the stick figure. And we used correspondence and we said measure uh, the similarity between the pixels. Uh, but we still didn't answer the question of how do you represent an image so that you can computationally, um, with a program, go in and uh, compute things over it. We also talked about this correlation as a correspondence mechanism uh, and why it's important for finding where uh, patches in one image moved when you uh, went from time T0 to a new version at time T1, uh, moving the camera. And we also explained how that's used for things like optic flow, uh, for 3D reconstruction, and we saw that 3D uh, instant replay, which is a pretty interesting uh, application. Okay, so... Let's take a look at something called the intensity surface. And I'm only going to talk about grayscale pic uh, pictures for now. Uh, but when you talk about color pictures, it's the same thing, except you have three different types of intensity. You have your red intensity, green intensity, and blue intensity. So here we have a picture of uh, 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 that cropped region from uh, that image of the turret, of the doorway, I mean. And it's in gray level, so things are values from 0 to 255, uh, representing the diagonals of the RGB color cube. Uh, and um, it's very simple. It's 8-bit unsigned quantities. So let's say we take this gray level image, and we kind of lay it down uh, like a carpet, right? Just kind of laying on the ground uh, in the XY plane. And I kind of stretched it a little bit to make it more visible, uh, the different pixel values that you might see. Now, it doesn't matter what the resolution is, how many rows and how many columns uh, comprise this particular image. But you can see that in some locations on this image, it's darker. It has a lower intensity. In other locations in this image, pixels, it's lighter. Right? You can also, in some regions, when you see this brick, this variation of grays, right? by the way, that's called a texture, which is a regular varying of, uh, of color, um, you'll notice that it goes from light to dark to light to dark in some pattern as you scan across or down uh, the image. So we lay this out, and we impose a set of axes to measure it. Now, the reason for the axes is because we need to identify this or describe this idea of where in the image. And those are called image coordinates, and you'll see that in the literature. And it's in XY or X1 and X2, uh, if you want to call it that. It's certainly in two dimensions because this represents a planar surface, okay? And so any particular pixel at some location, like in this example, we have this pixel corresponding to this kind of circular dot here, uh, and that's that position X1 comma Y1 uh, in so-called image coordinates. And so what this does is it locates on the image plane uh, where a particular picture element or pixel uh, is located. Okay, so we have a way to describe the location, but we need a way to describe the value, right? Uh, we don't, we're not there yet completely. And so we imagine the image as being governed by what's called an intensity function, right? Now, of course, every single position in that image, x comma y, has a particular intensity. So as a function, this intensity function, this i of x, y, it has two parameters, namely the x coordinate and the y coordinate within that image. Does that make sense? Any questions about this? So we have our intensity function, and this intensity function is responsible uh, for giving you all of the pixel values in gray level associated with a particular uh, image. The range of this uh, intensity function, i of x, y, is on the uh, integer number line, the positive integer number line uh, between 0 and 255, where 0 represents black, a version of gray, and 255 represents white, another version of gray. And so this intensity function, if you give it an xy coordinate uh, in the image plane, it's going to give you back a gray level intensity value. Okay? Any questions about this? Does that make sense? All right. So let's now draw a third axis. And this is called the intensity axis. 
And the purpose of this intensity axis is going to be the representation of the intensity value for that pixel at the XY coordinate on the image plane, okay? So if we were to do that, let's say for example, at this position, X1, Y1, the intensity level was 100. Now remember when we talked about grayscale, we first talked about RGB representation, the color cube, and we said that every color that you can represent in this RGB so-called color space uh, is a location within this cube where you have a mixture of red, green, and blue. We said that the gray values are all values uh, where you have equal parts, red, green, and blue. You can have something that's black, so you have 0, 0, 0, or you can have something that's white, which is 255, 255, 255. And in the color cube, this grayscale set of intensities represent, is represented as all points along the diagonal from origin uh, to the extreme, from black uh, to white, okay? And so here, our intensity function, using this third axis, the intensity axis, if at, for example, position x1, y1, the intensity surface function i, x, y, returned 100, whoa, that's like a, some sort of stinging insect or something. It's, what's that, a hornet or, oh, we are, pardon? Yeah, <laughs> and they usually travel with friends. All right. Now, if they were bees, I'd be okay with that. Get a little bit of honey somewhere in the building. All right, so <laughs> anyways, we have the intensity function. And um, in this particular case, if I of x, y um, for a position x1 at coordinate x1, y1 return intensity of 100, right, uh, we would mark that on the intensity uh, surface here as depicted. And so as you can see, a position x1, y1 in this description, uh, we draw that third axis, which is 100 tick marks up along the intensity axis. Okay, does that make sense? Any questions about that? All right, not from the uh, hornet though, but. Um, all right, so now of course, this is Z axis or third axis, we treat as the intensity axis. And if you have an intensity at pixel X1, Y1, and every pixel has an intensity, well, let's take a look at the next pixel. So let's say at pixel X2, Y2, what if that had an intensity value, and I'm just making up these values of 160, right? So that would mean uh, as far as the intensity axis is concerned, we go higher up, we mark 160 on the intensity surface associated with this uh, image coordinate x2, uh, y2. Okay, and you'll notice here that the intensity value at this point x2, y2, it's higher up uh, than uh, the intensity value at point x1, y1. So if we scan across and we look, say, at this pixel, we, let's call it x3, y3, it's about the same intensity as x2, y2. So we would again uh, draw uh, this projection here up, uh, and you'll notice here it's at uh, 160 along the intensity axis. And so then if we continue to go across, we notice that it's darker, uh, so the intensity value returned at say pixel x4, y4 uh, would be uh, 100, and you'll see uh, that it's lower down. So as you go from a darker color to a lighter color, your intensity value increases. We go from lower to higher, 100 to 160. It remains the same here, so it's 160. And then lastly, it goes back down to uh, 100. Does that make sense? Any questions about this? So this kind of looks like a relief map, and that's on purpose, right? This intensity surface, it encodes pixel values as elevations in a kind of relief map, and therefore, <laughs> have our intensities uh, of different heights, and um, it looks kind of like a relief map, and that's on purpose. Okay, so how do you characterize the content of your image? Now, if you were to plot this intensity surface for the entire image, I've only shown four different points here, um, you would get sort of a terrain, a, a relief map. And if you're going to measure the content of your image, Essentially, what you're doing is you're measuring um, the terrain features, if you will, uh, of this intensity uh, surface representation. And so what do you want to measure? You want to measure the flat planes, right? So if you look at x2, y2, and x3, y3, if you go across, that's relatively flat in its relief or elevation, right? Uh, you want to measure the hills, the bumps in the hills. 
So if you go from X1, Y1 to X2, Y2, it's an upward sloping hill. If you go from X3, Y3 to X4, Y4, it's an incline that's downward sloping. And so if you want to characterize or describe algorithmically the content of your image, what you're doing is taking inventory of the shape of the intensity surface. Does that make sense? Any questions about this? Okay, so how might you do that? Well, what you're gonna do is compute a statistic, a function over data that measures the slope. So let me ask you, how do you measure slope in any function? Change in y over x. What's the name for that function that does that? The, from calculus. The derivative. Absolutely. So you're going to use the derivative over the, the intensity surface or the change in y over change in x, delta y over delta x, the rise over the run, to characterize patches along the intensity surface. Uh, and when you get back uh, the results from that calculation, that will tell you something about the content uh, of your image, okay? All right, so essentially you run what are called scan lines, right? If you go from left to right, you know, your left to your right, uh, along the X direction in the image coordinate system, that's like taking a derivative, specifically a partial derivative. A partial derivative is nothing more than a derivative with respect to a particular variable. So in this notation, we have uh, d dx of, my in, of the intensity surface. Yeah. Um, so if you take the derivative with respect to the x direction, what you're capturing is the hilliness, if you will, the change in this relief map, right? And so one of the things you'll notice here, uh, there's an edge. Uh, and this edge represents a dramatic change in the intensity surface as you go in the x direction. So here we have dark, 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 dark. All of a sudden it goes to light in one or two pixel uh, distance. And so we can compute this derivative along x, along y, or we can combine the derivative uh, in x and y to get the orientation of the edge. So we can look at the slope in the x direction on the intensity surface. Likewise, we can also look at the slope in the y direction. When we look at the slope in the y direction, we're going along the direction of the y-axis uh, in uh, image coordinates. And if you notice here, this edge, this horizontal edge, we have dark, 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 all of a sudden it goes to light, right? It's a very steep hill in the intensity surface. And so by using uh, the derivative along x or along y, bless you, of this intensity surface, we're effectively measuring the hilliness or characterizing the, the terrain of this intensity surface, which looks like a relief map. Okay, any questions about this? Does that make sense? All right, let me uh, check the time, 10:12. All right, so how are we gonna do this? Let's take a look. Uh, so an edge, is a, a, a vertical edge is a large slope along the x direction, right? Uh, likewise, a horizontal edge is a large slope along the y direction. So if you wanted to describe the shape of something in an image, you would compute all the edges, and then given all the edges, you would take an inventory, like say a histogram, and say, show me the distribution of the orientations of all the edges. Now, why might you do that? Let's uh, take a look at why you might do that. I'm going to go on the board here. <clears throat> Hopefully this one's... So suppose you have an image, and let's say that image is of a city scene, right? So essentially you have some buildings, and if you look at the buildings, well, they have some windows, right? Now, if you were to extract all the edges uh, for such a scene, well, you're going to have a lot of 180-degree uh, edges, and you're going to have a lot of 90-degree edges, right? Because those would be the horizontal... Did it slide out? It's still in there? Okay. Um, you're going to have a lot of horizontal edges and vertical edges. So if you were to take a histogram uh, of the edge directions, uh, for this type of image, well, you scan along X, you scan along Y, and you use inverse tangent to find the orientation of these edges. 
you compute a histogram of all the edges and you're going to find that histogram is going to have two peaks, right? One at 90 degrees and one at 180 degrees. So in essence, using edges, you can characterize the shape of things in an image. Let's contrast that, for example, with an image, and let's say it had a bunch of fruit in it, right? And fruit are relatively round. Now, if you extract the edges from these fruits, you'd see that to go in a circle, you're going to have a bunch of edges equally represented at all the different orientations edges can be represented. So if you were to compute a histogram for that, you're going to get something 0 degrees, let's say 5 degrees, 10 degrees, etc. Um, you're going to get something that looks like a uniform distribution, right? Because you're going to have roughly equal representation of all the edge orientations. And so essentially, you can use <coughs> edges, and it's more correctly called an edge map. Uh, you can look or take inventory of the distribution of the edges in your image and use that to draw comparisons uh, between the shapes of things uh, that are contained within it. Okay? Any questions about this? Okay. So one of the things you can do is you can say, all right, well, there are some edges that are really strong edges, and you can see from this image, well, the edges for this doorway, those edges are stronger. They kind of stand out more than the edges between uh, each of these bricks, right? And so one of the things you can do, you can use hypothesis testing, right? Uh, you can say, okay, well, given the distribution of edge orientations, let me take uh, the 95th percentile, meaning the edge, edge magnitudes uh, that are the top 5% strongest edges, right? So you can also filter out edges based on how strong they are and also characterize other aspects of your image, right? And that's exactly um, like hypothesis testing. And it is actually hypothesis testing. And there are functions in MATLAB uh, to help you with that. Okay, so we have this edge. And let's recall from calculus, uh, when you talked about the definition of the derivative, you said ddx, uh, the derivative of some function f of x, is the limit of f of x plus delta x minus f of x as delta x uh, goes to zero. Uh, so what exactly does that mean? Well, uh, let's take a look at an arbitrary function f of x. I'll erase this. And so here's x. Here's f of x. Right? And here's x. And here's a distance delta x. And this is the value x plus delta x, right? And so if we take our value of x and we evaluate f of x, right, this point is our f of x. Let me erase that. It's our function f evaluated at x, okay? And this is, let me put it over here, x plus delta x. This is x plus delta x, and this is our function f evaluated at x plus delta x. Okay, so if we look at the distance along x, that difference is delta x, okay? So let's label that delta x. That's the run, right? That's the change in x. If we look at this difference here along y, well, this is just f of x plus delta x, and we subtract from it f of x. That's the rise. So slope is rise over run. Wow. Uh, slope is rise over run. And so if we express rise over run, that's just our change in y, f of x plus delta x minus f of x, over my change uh, in x, which is delta x. Now, what this limit represents, it says, let me take the smallest way that I can change x, right? Now, the smallest way you can change x uh, when you're dealing with real systems has to do with the sample rate, how quickly your measurements are taken. And so what this delta x limit as x goes, delta x goes to zero means, it says, okay, I want my rise over run, but I want it for the smallest delta x that I can get, right? Uh, because that characterizes the behavior of your function. Does that make sense? Any questions?
So how do we map this to an image? Well, how an image changes, an image, it deals with image coordinates. Now, you'll notice here, I'm taking my derivative with respect to x, but I have i of x, y. But I'm only changing my x, my dx, and taking the derivative with respect to that x. So anything that does not involve an x, for all intents and purposes, is a constant. So I plug in my function, i of x, y, and I note that in an image, when I change an image function, the smallest way my x can change is by going one pixel to the left or one pixel to the right. So if I have an image coordinate x, the next or smallest change I can have in my image coordinate is x plus one. I have a change of one. So for an image, my delta x is one. Does that make sense? And any questions about this? So going by this definition of a derivative, my derivative with respect to x of my intensity function i of x, y, and I'm taking the derivative because I want to know what the slope is as I go across this image. Well, that's just my function f of x plus delta x. So I don't change my y. So x plus delta x, x plus 1. So I have i of x plus 1 comma y um, minus f of x. And I say i of x minus 1 comma y. Now my reason for saying i minus x minus 1 is as follows. When I have my image, if I want to compute, let me redraw my function. So let's say we have a point uh, x. And if I want to know the slope at that point x, I essentially have my tangent line, right? And I want to measure how that tangent line uh, slopes upward or downward. And so if I want the slope at this point x, I need x plus delta x. And here I need x minus delta x in order to get the slope at that point, right? Computationally. And so I do that by going one pixel to the left and one pixel to the right. And I take the rise over the run. And that's how I take the slope because I need that tangent line in order to find the slope of that function, the intensity surface at that particular so-called center point. And so my delta x here, I have a delta of one to the left, a delta of one to the right. That's a total of delta two pixels. And so I write delta x is two uh, in the denominator. Does that make sense? And so I still need my f of x plus delta x, but because this is not a theoretical function, this is an actual set of values, in order to take the slope at a point, i.e. on my uh, relief map, on my intensity surface, I need to have that tangent line at the point, And the smallest way I can do that is by going one pixel to the left and one pixel to the right. OK. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? OK. So we have our definition of the derivative along x. And the similar thing uh, occurs uh, for the derivative along the y direction in image coordinates. OK. So this begets something called the central difference. And I'll explain, let me time check, um, <clears throat> what that means. So given this expression, we can actually decompose this definition for the derivative in the x direction into three terms. Well, we have 1 half times i of x plus 1 comma y. We have minus 1 half i of x minus 1 comma y. And then you can always add 0 to anything. It doesn't change this value. Right? So why not say 0 times intensity function evaluated at position x, y? So if we write out those three terms, we get the following expression. We have our derivative, decomposed, is minus 1 half i of x minus 1 comma y. Right? That's the second term here. Uh, we have plus 0 times i of x, y. Right? That's just 0. 0 times anything is 0. It doesn't change the value. And we have plus 1 half i of x plus 1 comma y. That corresponds to that term in the original expression. So this is called the central difference. And what that central difference does is computes rise over run, one pixel to the left, one pixel to the right, based on the intensity function. So how we can encode this is as follows. So here we have an image. And we're going to define a mask. A mask is just an array, 
and it has a bunch of numbers, and we're going to perform what's called a convolution. Convolution is nothing more than the multiplication of two sets or arrays of values with one another. Okay, and so in our so-called convolution mask, we have three numbers. We have minus one half, and to its right, we have zero, and to its left, we have plus one half. Now, these coefficients are the same coefficients in our new expression uh, for the derivative along the x direction. Here we have a leading minus one half. Here we have a zero for the second term. Here we have a positive one half. We write those out in order, minus one half, zero, plus one half. Now you'll notice here, for this image, we place this mask in some position x, y in the image. And the position of this mask is described by the position of the center element of this array. Zero is in the center of the array, right? And so this particular mask is positioned here, and its position is described by the center of the array. So now we can take this array, and this array sits over that image. And each position in the image has a pixel value, which is a gray level intensity. And that pixel value is essentially the intensity function evaluated. So if this mask is at position x, y, we're going to multiply the mask value 0 by whatever that image value is in position x, y. Okay? And then here we see to the left of that center of the mask, we see a minus 1 half. And that says, OK, well, what is the coordinate if this is x, y, that center position? Well, 1 to the left is x minus 1 comma y. And so now we take this minus 1 half and we multiply it by the pixel value associated with the position in the image that this particular element uh, is over. So if x, y is the coordinate in the image for this position, that's going to be x minus 1 comma y. And so we have this minus 1 half. If we multiply it by that gray value, that's this term of uh, the de decomposition of the derivative along x. Does that make sense? Any questions about this? So now we have 0 times the image value at x, y, which is the actual value of the image. We have minus 1 half times the image value at x minus 1 comma y, that coordinate. And now we have plus 1 half times that image value uh, to the right of the center of this mask. So if the center is at position x, y, we go 1 to the right, that's x plus 1 comma y is the coordinate of that position in the image. So we now have that third term, 1 half times i, the intensity surface uh, function value, uh, at position x plus 1 comma y. Okay? So in doing this, we can convert, using the definition of what the derivative is, uh, to the derivative of the intensity function uh, by adding the three terms together minus 1 half times the pixel value this is over, um, 0 times the pixel value in position x, y, uh, plus 1 half times uh, the pixel value in position x plus 1 comma y. Now you notice here I'm using x and y. It doesn't matter what x and y are. So once I compute that sum, I replace the value in the center in the image, not the mask, but the image itself. I replace that image value with the result of the sum, uh, which is the derivative. Okay, And so I do that in this first position, and then I slide the mask one position to the right, I do it in the next position, slide it one to the right, do it in the next one, next one, next one, next one, next one, and that's what convolution is. And the result is a so-called edge map. It's a new version of the image where all of the values are the edge values. Does that make sense? Okay, so we'll actually try that in MATLAB uh, next time, hopefully no Hornets will be flying around the room. Um, we said approaching storm. That's not what we meant. But anyways, um, so this is the so-called central difference. Uh, it's the difference uh, across the center value. And it's how you calculate uh, the derivative uh, along x, in this example, uh, for the intensity surface. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? All right. So this results in the slope, and the slope is centered at each image coordinate x, y. It involves a statistic using a sum. So we sample every three pixels, and we can use this to isolate uh, the steepest uh, edge uh, in your image. OK. Uh, let me do a time check. It's 10.30. I don't know if I'm going to have time to do the MATLAB. 
wasn't expecting the, <laughs> the Hornet stuff. Um, I think I'm going to end early here and then pick back up on Tuesday because I really don't want to break this MATLAB stuff in two different sittings. Uh, so I will just end here. Uh, and uh, we lost a little bit of time because of that flying thing, um, but eh, it happens. All right, so any questions about this? All right, so I'll build up the machinery uh, when we open on Thursday, Thursday's class meeting, because um, I know this is going to take me more than 15 minutes uh, to set up, explain, and do, and show you an example. Uh, and I don't want to break it across two different meetings. Uh, so we'll end there early, and um, I will see you all on Thursday.